Happy New Year, everyone. Michael Corsentino for Shutter Magazine. I hope you guys all had a wonderful, happy holiday season and are as excited about 2018 as I am. A whole new year of tutorials and creativity, and I can't wait to dig in with this month's installment. In this video and the companion article in Shutter Magazine, the January edition, uh, and guys, if you haven't gotten yourself a subscription to Shutter Magazine, by all means, definitely worth uh, doing. You can do that over at BehindTheShutter.com, where you can sign up to get yourself a print subscription as well as a digital subscription. So definitely head over there and get that all buttoned up. This month, I wanted to share with you how I plan what equipment to bring with me on my location lighting assignments. And that's why I call this month's feature Anatomy of a Location Lighting Kit. Now, that said, every time uh, you do a job or every time I do a job, it's always going to be different. You're always going to have different considerations. And that's really what we're going to talk about. I will address all the factors and considerations that determine exactly what equipment I bring uh, for various jobs. In this case, we're dealing with a specific set of circumstances, which we'll cover. Um, and uh, that, of course, uh, you know, dictates exactly what I bring with me. So you'll see here two of the final shots that were created. I just put these here because I wanted to show you that typically I'm planning for a variety of looks. So you can see here that we've got a, uh, a nice kind of edgy look and then we've got a nice soft look. So choosing the right equipment, equipment that will allow me to create a variety of looks and gives me plenty of creative options is super important. What I want is equipment that's going to give me plenty of flexibility, creative options, enough backups in case things go south, but not so much gear that it becomes a burden. So the amount of equipment is really going to depend on a number of factors and it really kind of translates into the production value, although you can achieve a tremendous production value without having a lot of gear and that's what we did in this shoot. But anyway, we'll discuss all that in the next slide. So here's a list of some of the most important things and the considerations and factors that go into uh, how I choose what to bring with me for various jobs. And we're going to discuss this job in particular, but these uh, factors and considerations really apply to all jobs. But I will, uh, I'll address this particular job based on these, this set of criteria. So uh, the lighting plan, obviously the number of looks that you're going to create, that's going to dictate which uh, modifiers that you bring with and the grip equipment that you're going to use to support those modifiers. Uh, the number of assistants, whether you're going to have any assistance, and if so, how many, uh, that's going to dictate whether you need light stands or not, um, whether you want to use extension poles and have your assistants hold them. Uh, that, of course, goes to also how much equipment that you can bring, how many bags is feasible for you to bring with you. If it's just me, then it, as, it, as it was with this shoe, there's just going to be two bags, one roller bag with all my lighting equipment um, and tripods, etc. you know, miscellaneous equipment, and then my camera bag. So that would just be those two bags. If I have multiple assistants, uh, then that number can increase and it really just depends on the complexity of the job and what's called for. Uh, location logistics, light stands use. Can I use light stands? Uh, do I need a permit? Uh, what is the terrain like? Is it flat terrain? Is it hilly? Uh, is it a beach? Is it sand? Uh, all of those things are going to play into uh, my decisions about what equipment to bring, what's feasible, and what's going to be you know, too much of a burden. Uh, the distance of the location from parking, another important consideration. What are the ambient lighting conditions that are called for on that day, that, you know, the weather forecast? Um, and what is my backup plan in case that uh, lighting condition does not exist when I get there? Um, then you need backups for equipment. What if my uh, light pack goes down, my strobe equipment doesn't work? Uh, I need a compact equipment. I need lightweight equipment. And then I need, again, to determine the number of cases that are feas feasible based on personnel, location, terrain, and distance from vehicles. All right, let's look at each of the items on this list as they apply to the images featured in this video. Uh, the images that I needed to produce for this assignment. Uh, so I had a lighting plan uh, that called for two looks. That's basically what I wanted to create. So I knew that I needed to choose uh, tools that would allow me to do that. Uh, I knew that there were no assistants on this job. It was just going to be me. I would be flying solo when it came to moving gear. I would have the help of 
uh, her, the uh, subject's family, uh, which also uh, was a consideration. Uh, because of that, I knew that I would be able to use uh, an extension paint pole to hold the key light uh, because I would have the help of the family to hold the light. I asked them and they said, sure. So that was a good thing. Um, uh, I knew that, you know, because we were working um, uh, locations that were public, one was a train station uh, and one was a park, which would be the easier of the two. Uh, we were going to choose anywhere from three to four, but depending on how much we could get done. But they were all public. I had not pulled a permit. Uh, and I knew that at the train station, a light stand was not going to fly. Uh, I did pack one just in case I needed to use one elsewhere, uh, or it turned out that I was able to use one at the train station and I needed it. And I'll show you exactly where I was planning. That's kind of what was a backup in case I didn't have sun. And that goes to this number here, which is ambient lighting conditions. I was planning on either sun or overcast conditions, uh, but it was my backup plan in case either or of those situations doesn't exist. Um, so that's definitely a consideration. So I wanted to make sure that I had enough equipment to handle uh, my plan as well as uh, plenty of backup options. Um, other considerations were the distance from parking. I knew that it was probably, uh, since we're dealing with multiple locations, there's a good chance. I hadn't shot in any of these locations before. I just scouted them on Google. Uh, and I knew that parking was probably not going to be close. So again, that played into uh, how much equipment I was going to bring. Uh, I opted for just two bags because that was all that was really feasible with just one person. Um, one uh, bag, one really large roller bag, which I'll show you later, for all of the lighting and miscellaneous equipment, and one bag for my camera and lenses. Uh, backups, another really, really important consideration. I definitely always plan plenty of backups, not just for the electronic equipment like strobes, but also for lighting modifiers in case a lighting modifier breaks or it's not feasible on location, it's too windy, whatever the situation is, you need to have plenty of backups. I always make sure for jobs like this that my equipment is as compact as possible. So I have to work with plenty of collapsible uh, uh, products, which I'll show you later, modifiers uh, as well as um, reflectors and you know uh, diffusers, etc. Uh, and of course, uh, also lightweight. Uh, and again, uh, the number of cases feasible based on personnel. In this case, it was just going to be me moving, uh, moving equipment, and the location train was more or less going to be pretty flat. Uh, and again, the distance from vehicles was going to be a variable, so we opted for just two cases. I'll start with the most obvious tool in my location kit, and that's going to be my camera. This is a Phase One DF Plus with an IQ 250 digital back, and the three lenses that I always have with me are my 80 millimeter leaf shutter 1.28, uh, 50 millimeter, uh, and the uh, 150 millimeter lens. More often than not, I default to the 80. Uh, but again, like most of what we're going to look at uh, in my lighting kit, in my overall kit for location, much of it I don't end up using. Uh, but but uh, and that's good because I want to keep things simple and I don't want to overcomplicate things. Uh, I want to be focused on making images and not fussing with gear. However, you want to have options. You want to have what you need when you need it, if you need it. Right. So the worst thing is to need something and not have it. I would much rather have more than I need than not what I need in the event that I need it. Right. Uh, so uh, basically, I end up, you know, 90 percent of the time, at least for this shoot, using the 80 millimeter lens. I think I popped on the 55 uh, at one one or two points, but uh, most of the time it was the 80. I don't think the 150 ever got any usage because I wasn't doing kind of head and shoulders portrait stuff or really tight stuff. Um, and plenty of memory. I always have the uh, eight uh, SanDisk 16 gig cards with me. All right, so that's enough of that. And that all went in one bag. That was, that was the second, uh, there were only two bags and that was one of the bags. All right. Next, um, also in that bag was the light meter, the Sekonic, uh L50 L758 DR. Uh, now, why? I, what I like about this meter, and um, I worked intuitively on this shoot because I've been doing this for so long that I can pretty much, you know, create the balance between ambient and flash that I want intuitively. However, if I'm having any problems, this meter is indispensable because you see here this percentage readout. Now it's, it says 100 here uh, because that's just this is just a uh, product shot uh, that I took from the internet. But 
In an ambient light fla and, and flash mixture situation, you can read the percentage of light and you can d set the percentage of light that you're getting from your flash. And in the case of something where I want a very natural looking blend between ambient and flash, I want this number at 20%. And if I want something more edgy and flashy looking, I'll bring it up to say 40% by just dialing up the amount of light on my flash. And then when I take a reading using this meter, it's going to tell me, oh, 20% or 40% of your exposure, 40% of the light contributed to this exposure is coming from your flash. Right? And this way you can kind of figure out where you are percentage wise if you're comfortable working that way with flash. It's a great way to work. I worked that way for a long time. Now I kind of can do it intuitively. But if, I, if things are not are being wonky or I don't have the time to work intuitively, I just use the meter and it gets me there really quickly. So I always have my meter with me just in case. These two images are perfect examples of the different amount of flash contributed to an exposure and the effect that it has on the look of the image. So on the left, you can see we've got more flash being contributed. Uh, I'm also at uh, probably about uh, minus two, uh, underexposed by two f-stops uh, here uh, on the ambient light to give it a darker, more contrasty look between flash and ambient. And then over here, uh, I, my, my flash and ambient are much more balanced. Uh, here I've probably got a 20% amount of flash contributed to the exposure. Uh, here is probably, you know, about 40% of flash contributed to the exposure. Here I'm underexposed in my ambient. Here I am not underexposed in my ambient. I am zero, okay? Plus or minus zero. Um, so I'm right on point there, and I've got about a 20% uh, contribution of flash. So it's just very, very, just a little kiss of light, just filling it in and creating this really nice balance. So two very different looks, uh, just by using uh, the uh, contribution of flash, the amount of flash, and uh, how you're controlling your ambient. And obviously you're doing that by using uh, shutter speed. Uh, is controlling the amount of ambient light. If you want more ambient light, like this image, you are going to use a slower shutter speed. And if you want less ambient light, like this image, you're gonna use a faster shutter speed to knock down the ambient light. My lighting plan called for one key light on an extension pole with a modifier, in this case, the uh, Ellen Chrome Quadra, which I will show you later. Uh, but I packed two uh, Ellen Chrome Quadra Rangers because I always want backup. So I have two heads and two packs when I'm only planning on using one. Uh, and I packed extra batteries, which I'll show you later. I also packed a the um, Skyport HS uh, trigger, the controller, which is here, that allows me to control multiple heads if need be. Um, as well as just one head in this case from the camera position, which is really convenient. However, I always want backups for triggers as well because it's the really the little things that can go wrong that can really hamstring you when you're shooting, uh, especially on location and you don't have all your stuff uh, at your disposal. If one wrong move, one thing goes down, and you know you can really be in a bad in bad shape. So extra triggers, I always pack. Pocket Wizards as well. They're manual, they're super reliable, I always know that they're going to work. Even then, uh, I pack one for each, so you've got one uh, for pack one uh, right here, one for pack two, one for the camera, and an extra one just in case. And PC cords, these things are notoriously failure uh, prone, prone to failure. So I have two, uh, one for each pack, and one extra. Okay, so always, and again, I didn't end up using any of these, but if I would have needed them, boy, would they have come in handy. Uh, but happily, I didn't need them. I chose the Quadra Ranger uh, as my key light uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, they are super lightweight, very easy for someone to hold uh, on a paint pole without fatiguing uh, their arm and getting them, uh, you know, angry at me and tired really quickly. They're very easy to hold uh, for an extended period of time. Um, they are, again, very lightweight, uh, and they have 400 watt seconds of power, more than enough power uh, for what I typically end up needing. To hold the Quadra strobe heads in place, or head in this case, uh, I packed a Shoreline uh, extension paint pole. Uh, and that uh, is this. They come in three different lengths. I have them all. Uh, I pack the middle length uh, because it gives me, you know, typically more than enough uh, 
uh, reach uh, for someone to hold a paint pole. Uh, and uh, to accommodate the five-eighths um, female uh, that, that you need a stud for at the end of the, um, of the strobe, uh, I use this thing. And this is a Casey five-eighths adapter. It's made by a company called Casey, K-A-C-E-Y. It's called the Casey Paint Pole Adapter. Um, another one of these really little indispensable tools uh, that without it, I would be in bad shape. So always make sure that you pre-flight your gear. That's one thing I haven't talked about before. Uh, I make sure that I pre-flight everything, make sure everything fits together, that I have all these little bits and pieces because one missing part can really uh, cause a, a, you know, a bad situation. Okay, so uh, that's what I use to hold the key light and this way uh, my assistant can hold the light uh, without being fatigued and we can move with a lot of flexibility. Uh, you, you know, you can move quickly from place to place and uh, as long as they're maintaining, I'm working manually, so as long as they're maintaining their position, uh, the same distance from the subject, once I set my exposure, we're good to go and we can just, you know, really kind of run and gun. Uh, now, I also included a an Avenger light stand, uh, a medium duty light stand. And that was in case I needed to, uh, in case I didn't have the sun and I needed to use the umbre an umbrella and a strobe uh, as my backlight, as my rim light. And I'll show you these lighting diagrams later, what I, what I had in mind, what I envisioned for this shoot when I was planning it. Uh, was basically a cross light lighting pattern where I use the key light uh, as the strobe as a key light and then I use the sun as a rim light. So if the sun was not out and I needed um, a uh, I needed to uh, create a rim light, an artificial rim light, that's where this light stand would have come into play. Or I could have another uh, another family member hold a second light. But ideally, I would just use this and I would put a second light here and I would gel it with CTO gel and I would use an umbrella in order to uh, kind of mimic the shape of of the sun and the broad light quality of the sun and the CTO gel, color temperature orange gel, would give me the warmth of the sun. Uh, so you can always recreate that and um, we'll look at those, um, we'll look at a slide that details that later. But anyway, this is, uh, I'll call this the grip equipment slide because it talks about, you know, it's basically how are you, uh, how are you holding all of your lights in place? How are you supporting your lights? So again, Shoreline Paint Pole, KC Paint Pole Adapter, and then an Avenger light stand, and all of that packed into that same one rolling bag. To modify the light from my key light, I packed an Ellen Chrome 27.5 inch Rotolux Deep Octa, and you can see that here. Uh, in order to uh, make these modifiers work with the Quadra, you need adapters, and that's what these are. I packed two in case one failed, and here you can see how I would be using it. This is how it's used on the extension pole, in this case the Shoreline paint pole that you saw in the previous slide. Now I love this modifier for a number of reasons. First of all, and there's a ton of great modifiers out there, but this is, but, but this is one that I end up using a lot. Um, first of all, it's really, really compact. Uh, it packs down into a, a very small space. I take it all the time when I travel. It, it fits you know, into my travel case really easily. Um, yet, it has a really good amount of coverage. You can use it for full figure as well as tighter. Um, you, it's got this diffusion here and interior diffusion as well. So you can create a, anything from, uh, you, when you're using it, you can create a really soft look. Uh, you can take it off and get a less soft look and then you can remove the di interior diffusion entirely uh, and reveal its silver interior and get a, a much more specular look. So it gives you a lot of variety uh, for such a small modifier. Um, and uh, for only one modifier, you get a ton of options using this. So one of my favorites. And here are a couple sample images from around the net that show you what this, uh, what the Quadra head uh, and the uh, Ellen Chrome Rotolux Deep Octa, the small 27.5 inch look like in action when used on a, an extension pole. The second modifier that I brought with me was a Lastolite 8-in-1 umbrella. It's 41 inches. Now there are a ton of great umbrellas that you can uh, that, that are out there and available. Uh, I love this one because of its 8-in-1 options and you can see them here. You can use this umbrella in a variety of ways based on its construction and the fabrics that it comes with. It's a convertible umbrella and that is what I would recommend in any case. Whichever umbrella you choose, I would get a convertible one that allows you to shoot bounce back as well as shoot through. Uh, so for the purposes of this shoot, my plan was to use it this way as a shoot through 
if I needed to, uh, and I would uh, use it with a strobe instead of a speed light, I would use a strobe here, and I would gel it with CTO gel, and I would shoot it toward the subject, to the back, toward the back of the subject, in order to replicate the warmth uh, and the illumination from the sun. If I didn't have afternoon sun, uh, if I had an overcast situation, that's what I would do. And that is why I packed this particular modifier. It would also uh, serve as a backup in case my Rotolux, uh, my Deep Octa, uh, went down on, on location. It uh, failed. It was broken. Whatever. It didn't work. Uh, I, you know, something went wrong with it. You always want to have backups. You always want to have options. So the umbrella would serve two purposes. It would serve. It would act as a backup in case something went wrong with the with the Rotolux, um, with the Deep Octa, uh, and it would work if the sun. If I didn't have sun as a rim light. One thing that I always have with me in my location lighting kit are reflectors and diffusers. And, and it, depending on uh, the complexity of the job, they will vary in shape and size. For this job, I went super compact and used the Lastolite Tri-Grip uh, reflector as well as diffuser. So on the left, you see the 8 and 1 version. This is the 8 and 1 version. I think they use an N, 8 and 1. Um, and it gives you all these fabrics and, as well as diffusion here. Uh, so typically I end up using this with uh, white or silver uh, as a reflector and then this is one is the diffusion version. Uh, so I'll use this to diffuse the light from above or light from a strobe. Uh, they pack down into a really small form factor here you see it here, probably about a third of their expanded size. Fits right into cam in the camera bag. And what's really cool about these is they also have a hand grip incorporated into to the design. Uh, so they collapse, they, you know, they twist uh, closed and then they expand open when you need them and, you, and they have a handle incorporated. So really cool stuff and uh, again indispensable tools when working with both ambient as well as strobe. Uh, it's really important to when you, when, you, uh, when you get on set, uh, when you get to the location to really assess the light because sometimes you don't even need to bust out a strobe. You can just use the ambient light but you need to be able to control and shape ambient light just like you need to be able to control and shape strobe. Here are two sample images where you can see uh, the tri-grip being used uh, in action. Um, here on the left you can see it, uh, the diffuser being used to diffuse overhead sun and the reflector uh, underneath being used to bounce back light and provide fill. Uh, this is clamshell lighting. I use it all the time. You can also, if you don't have sun, you can fire a strobe through here as well. Another great way to do it. And over here on the right, you can see uh, there's obviously sun back here, and that is this reflector is being used to bounce that light back into the model. Another great way to work. Uh, again, you know, a great way to work without using any strobe at all. So I always want to make sure that I have options at my disposal in case, let's say, my flashes fail. What happens if the electronics aren't working? Well, reflectors and diffusers provide those options for me. One of the other things that's always part of my location kit is the California Sunbounce Dress Tube. It is a great compact solution for models changing on location. It provides all the privacy they need to quickly change and get into wardrobe and get back to shooting. I also packed two tripods and a three-way Manfrotto uh, pan and tilt head. Uh, this is the uh, Gitzo carbon fiber, and this is a really right stuff ground tripod, ground-based tripod, ground-level tripod. Uh, I typically pack these. I don't use them a lot, but they are indispensable for creating effects like this. So this is a two... Uh, two exposure trick essentially where the camera is on a tripod here uh, it never moves you take one exposure for the background along with the model in place then you bring in your light light stand etc whatever lights you want to use I think we had two here uh, you'd make a second exposure with the flash and then in post you strip out all of the lights, they disappear, they go bye-bye. So by having everything on a tripod, by having the camera on a tripod, everything remains in registration. Everything matches up uh, with both exposures. There's, not, there's no movement at all in the frame um, of the background as well. So, and obviously you can't see the lights because you strip them out using masks in Photoshop. So uh, that's why I have tripods, just in case I wanna do something like that. I did not end up doing that in this shoot.
All right, this seems kind of like a silly slide, but I included it because I cannot overestimate uh, how important it is to include plenty of extra batteries. So here I've got an extra battery for my Quadra. I've got plenty of batteries. I think I've 10 batteries for my phase one. I've got a battery for the extra battery for the meter. Uh, and I've got, of course, extra double uh, A's for everything else, pocket wizards, etc. So bring pack plenty of batteries. In your own location, the last thing you want to do is run out of power. In my location lighting kit, you will also always find CTO gel, and that you see that on the left. That is color temperature orange gel. I bring a roll of that, and that allows me to gel the lights if I need to, uh, specifically, typically my background light if I'm using one. If I, if I have an overcast day and I do not have the sun, the warmth of the sun, I can add it back by using CTO gel on a strobe and recreate that afternoon glow uh, of afternoon sun. Uh, also, I have a roll of gaff tape so that I can tape the CTO gel to the strobe reflectors uh, or uh, onto a modifier, whatever I need to do. Uh, gaff tape is another indispensable uh, thing to have in your kit. Uh, and again, this was CTO gel. Uh, color temperature orange and a pair of Fiskars so that I can cut the gel as needed into shape. Okay, so that's uh, what we call expendables. And last but not least, cases to hold everything. So again, I opted for two, uh, two cases for this shoot because it was just me and I knew that anything more than that would be impossible. So on the left, you see the phase one uh, Pelican case, which held my camera, lenses and the meter and batteries uh, for the camera um, and uh, various bits and pieces, odds and ends. And on the left, you see Man the Manfrotto large roller bag. Now, I have the Cata version of this, but it's the same bag, Cata is no longer producing and Manfrotto picked up the line. So uh, the Manfrotto large roller bag is a phenomenal piece of kit. Uh, you can see here an interior shot. This is not my stuff, but it gives you an idea of what you can fit. Uh, use this compartment to fit the light stand and my tripods um, and everything else goes in the other pockets. And so you can fit a lot in here and it's manageable for one person. So I carry one, uh, this one with one hand and the camera bag with my other hand. So this was the lighting concept that I had in mind when I thought about this shoot. I wanted to be able to create two looks uh, using one modifier, using the Okta, and you can see that here. Uh, using a cross light scenario, so I would either uh, and I would vary my ambient light in order to you know lessen the ambient light to create a more dramatic look and increase the amount of flash, or I would use uh, a, a, you know more ambient light and less flash in order to create that more wide open soft look. And I'll show you examples of that. The idea was to use the sun uh, behind the subject as a rim light uh, to provide light here, and the key light obviously to light this side of the subject, and that works beautifully if you have the sun. Uh, it's a great one light um, uh, method of working. Uh, essentially, you've got two lights for the price of one because you're using the sun as a kicker light. All right. But in the event that you don't have the sun, and again, this is why we pack extra stuff. This is why we have options and uh, extra gear in case things don't go the way that we want. Uh, we uh, And so that's what I used to create this before we move on to what we would do if we didn't have that. So here you can see you've got uh, sun in the background and that's giving us this lovely kicker light uh, all around the subject. You can even see some of it peeking through here. And then we've got the Quadra uh, and the uh, Rotolux Deep Octa giving, uh, serving as our key light over here and that's lighting her up. Right? So we've got a really nice dramatic look. We've knocked down the ambient about two stops um, by using our shutter speed, by using a faster shutter speed. And that has just created this really nice, dramatic, punchy, kind of edgy look. I'll take off all that drawing so you can see that better. All right. Uh, now, we this is the opposite end of the spectrum where I have used a slower shutter speed to allow more ambient light to come in. I've lessened the amount of flash a little bit and that gives us a more natural balance between flash and ambient. So let's take a look at what we've got going on here. We still have the sun back here. You can see that it's giving us a nice little edge light here, much more subdued, but it's still there. Uh, and then we've got our key light over coming from over here and that is lighting up here. We've got some nice catch lights going on there. Always want to pay attention to that. It's actually, the key light is actually coming from up above. Um, uh, and it's a lovely result, but different than this, but with the same modifier and the same equipment. All right, that takes care of that. And here is another example 
uh, of using that one light and using a more natural blend of ambient and flash. Uh, same exact equipment, uh, same uh, positioning of the sun. We've got the sun behind the subject and that's giving us a nice little edge light on the left side of her. Uh, I don't have a drawing layer on this one, so I'm not going to draw. Um, and then we've got our key light over on the left as well. And that again is still that quadra and that uh, deep octa. And here's another example like that. So you can see we can really get a nice variety of looks using the same equipment. Now, if we had an overcast situation, this is where the extra equipment comes in. This is where I'm going to employ that umbrella and I am going to use, in this case, a second strobe. So you can see here that I've placed that here behind the subject exactly where the sun was previously. Uh, let's see if we can go back to that one slide. You can see here, here we have the sun. Now, if we don't have the sun, if it's overcast, I need something to replicate that. So that's where I'm using another strobe, uh, another quadra in this case, which I have packed in case I need it, and the eight and one umbrella, which I would, going, which I would use as a shoot through. Uh, and that is going to give me that same kind of shape of the sun and the warmth of the sun based on the CTO gel. And it's going to give me all that rim light and edge light that I want right there. Everything else with the key light remains constant, stays exactly the same. All I've done is introduced a second light with some warmth in order to replicate the sun. All right. Uh, now, one other thing that I can do, this is why I bring the reflectors, again, in that scenario where all of a sudden your strobes are not working, your batteries run out, everything goes south, you know, you want to have options and maybe maybe you show up and the light is perfect and you don't even need to use this one. Maybe they haven't failed, but, you know, you don't need to use them. You want to use reflectors and diffusers instead. That's another option, right? You want to have options. So in this case, uh, the sun is behind the subject again, use as, serving as a second light, as a rim light, doing that same thing that it did before. But now, instead of using a key light, I'm using a reflector as a key light. And you can use white or silver. I've got both in my bag. Uh, it's just a different fabric. You know, they're reversible. Um, and I'm using that to kick light back into the subject and to illuminate the subject. Another great way to work. It all depends what kind of conditions you know you find when you show up on location. All right. Now, here is another scenario. Let's say you have the sun in front of the subject or overhead from the subject. So all you do is you place a diffuser. Here you've got one of those uh, tri-grip diffusers placed over the subject or in front of the subject to diffuse this light. Okay, and to soften it, you want to create shadow. Basically, what you're doing is you're always looking for open shade. You're looking for shade, and that's what we're doing with diffusers is we're creating shade. Now, what I've also done is underneath that, I'm using a second modifier. I'm using a reflector, and that can be either white or silver. Okay, and that's that clamshell lighting that you saw earlier. So another great way to work, just depends where the sun is in the sky, depends you know, what kind of lighting conditions you have at your disposal and whether or not you wanna use flash or not. So here's a series of images from the shoot that demonstrate uh, that open shade concept that I was talking about previously. So basically here, instead of the sun being behind the subject, the sun is actually here, but it's being it's being blocked by this overhang. So that is giving us the open shade. And then we're popping in our light here, right? Our key light. This is again on a paint pole, just using that Quadra and that Ellen Chrome uh, Deep Octa. And that's giving us this quality of light, okay? So we're finding that, we're creating that shade by putting her under the overhang. Uh, the sun is in front of her, but it's blocked. So we got a nice over, uh, we've got a nice, um, open shade, and then we're just augmenting. We're using fill flash to fill in and open up the open up the light, and give us the light that we want. And you can modulate that to your heart's content. It can be you know uh, more flashy or less flashy, uh, and so uh, it works great. Here's another example of open shade. We've got her uh, again uh, under an overhang, blocking the sun, and then uh, we're bringing in our key light from here. Right, and that's creating a lovely effect. All right, before I wrap things up, I wanted to give you one other option. We can call this a bonus round. This is another way to use uh, diffusers and reflectors. Uh, if you do not have a softbox, or again, if your softbox uh, ends up uh, blowing away or isn't working for you, uh, this is another great option. Basically, what you can do is you just use one of these uh, diffusing panels, in this case, the tri-grip, and you can fire a flash through it. 
right? And that is going to essentially create a softbox effect. And here I've got another uh, reflector underneath uh, and that I would use to create clamshell lighting. And obviously this would slide underneath here and it would give me, uh, it would fill in light from above uh, and open up any shadows created under the subject's eyes and chin, etc. So another great way to work here, I've got the sun behind, that's going to give me the rim light here. Uh, exactly what we created, but it's just kind of makeshift uh, in, in a pinch, a great way to work. So I wanted to include that for you. Uh, another great option in case things don't work out or in case you don't have a soft box. Uh, and here is how you would work it if you had the overcast day. Same thing, you're just gonna bring in an umbrella uh, and that uh, and gel it with CTO gel, uh, gel your strobe with CTO gel, and that's going to give you that sun effect that we want. All right, well that is going to wrap it up for this video. We covered a lot of ground. I hope you guys have picked up a few things, learned a few things along the way. And I will see you next month.